So I was saying that the first thing is, the, the important thing to learn is to pop people. You make the lead artist slightly brighter than everything around them, your attention will go to them. But there are, there's a, and this morning I was talking about how do you make bigger shots the same way you make smaller shots. You light something the way you would light a head and shoulders, and if you get a bigger set, same as you always do, just bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you use exactly the same principle. So if I would like with a small light there to light the artist and I need to light the entire harbour, then I have to work out what the spread is and if the shot's going to be 450 foot wide, then the light needs to be at least 450 foot away. It's that simple. You know, you just scale it all up, but you keep the... What the big mistake people make is use lots of little lights. And if you use lots of little lights, you end up with overlapping problems, nothing matching, big light far away. If you're shooting exteriors, use mirrors and reflectors because big lights have different color temperatures to the sun, that light changes. If you're using mirrors and reflectors, it's the same light all the time. It's really easy. Once you've got a balance of the light, the balance will stay the same because if the big source up there changes, all of it changes in the same ratio. So when the uh, part of the trailer you showed the one where they went outside, did you match the person who shot daylight with the lights inside? I generally shoot interiors in daylight, daylight balance now rather than tungsten. I sometimes shoot tungsten, but I shoot daylight because these cameras are inherently daylight. The CMOS sensors are 5,000 Kelvin, generally, rule of thumb. Um, varies slightly, but it's roughly what it is. Um, so to get the optimum out of them, you shoot at 5,000 Kelvin. When I shot Wallander on the first series of Red Ones, the Red Ones had an incredible problem with blue noise. And if you shot in tungsten light with them and electronically corrected it, um, they got really noisy. And if you put a blue filter on, you lost two stops. So if you're shooting low light level by tungsten, you can't do that. And so I persuaded the director that we should basically be shooting the tungsten stuff with a daylight balance so it all looked really warm and cozy and, and cuddly and nice. And the people, so I gave him an artistic reason for shooting with a really warm look and he bought it. Whereas in fact the reality was we're shooting with a really warm light because the camera couldn't cope. <laughs> and it was a way round it. And you know, DP bullshitting to get himself out of trouble. That's a continuing theme. And what I'll show you in a second is when it comes to lighting, you'll get people saying, you know, three-point lighting, key, fill, backlight. You never see that in real life. You never, ever see that in real life. Um, the six years I did with Terence Donovan, I managed to slip a backlight in, I think, twice. He hated backlight because you don't see it in real life. If you could motivate it, like if I look at you, you're backlit because it's coming from the window. Fine, there's a reason for it. But if there's not a reason for it, why stick a backlight in? Just maybe because you want to separate them from the background, but there are better ways of doing that. You can light the background, blah, 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 blah. Basic lessons. Beauty light comes from there. Beauty light goes straight down the nose. So the actress, if you're doing a beauty light on the actress, chem light is there, straight down the nose. If you're using a china ball, you can follow them around, but if it's a static shot, if it's static beauty light, the standard one is a soft light about that square, directly over camera, there, right in front of you. Drama, you move the same light round to there. Beauty, drama. Beauty, drama. Okay, I've taught you everything I know. Off you go. That's it. That is absolutely it. Somewhere between beauty and drama, is an interview. That really is all you need to know. You then do it hard or soft, depending on what you like. So let's start with a victim. Oh, this, in fact, I'll do myself. Why not? Okay, so do you want to frame a head and shoulders on me on that? I've not done it this way before, it'll be fun. Ooh, flare. Ouch. Take the camera up. Yeah, you'll have to go from the bottom. 
pretend I'm an aging actress, in which case you want to be forcing her eye line up. You force the actress's eye line up on close-ups because you tighten this up. You know, it's... Depends. Um, the answer is yes. If you've got this, <laughs> then yeah, it helps, you know, because it's forcing it to tighten up. You know, if I do that, there's all this wobble there. If I do that, it gets a bit, bit better. Um, but then again, it's the whole thing. Do you want them to look hunky or do you want them to look... So what we'll do on this is if we take one of the flags I was going to use to narrow a face down and we'll stick it somewhere there-ish. This is going to get complicated because I'm going to block my key light out. It's just a stop flare on the camera. Above the left. Yeah. So if you move slightly further to the to my right. Okay. Oh, go back. I'm trying to get it centered. Go keep further back. Okay, there. Now move it up. Stop. Ooh, fucking hell, we're close. Take it down. Whoop, take it up. Okay, there. Um, so I don't need a backlight on this. Can you center me up on that? So I'm banging the center of frame. Okay, what we'll do is we'll stop down now. I don't know what stop you're at, but take it down two stops. There, that's good. Um, so... Because I've done that, I need to bring my key in from that side. We'll still do it from that side. So give me the hard light. What side do you want? I want it there. I remember doing a workshop in Hanover, and it was really embarrassing because I didn't realize I kept doing that. <laughs> Causing much laughter. Yeah, that's about right. Um, hmm? Yeah. Okay, stop it down even more. That's helping. Okay, so what you need is you want to get, I can't see now, obviously. You want to get a triangular shadow there. So if it needs to go further around that way, which I think it might need to. It's a classic Rembrandt light. Is Yeah, try that. Now I'm looking over there. Yeah. So, but I hate it because it's so hard. So at the right angle, could be a smidgen high, but we'll keep it there. Um, but it looks, this is weird. I can't do it on myself. I'm gonna have to actually. <laughs> and look straight at camera. Yeah, higher please. Just keep your head forward and I'm going to point at your face. What I'm trying to do is butch superhero lighting. You want this shadow to come across here. You want a little triangle around there. So it needs to go even further that way. Whoop. Just, you're doing what I was doing. Okay, about there. That's your butch superhero look. And what you do then is you get them to look halfway through. Look at the stand. Just shift your head towards, so your head's pointing there. Your nose lines on that. And that's your male hero lighting, done. Really straightforward. Most actors will like you if you do that. Most actresses will not like you if you do that. So what you do when you get the actress in is, can we bring the frame in? No. Yeah. Sorry, can you just put the male superhero yeah. lighting? I'm being... <laughs> Quite seriously. Yeah. Um, and also, when you're doing a beauty shoot, the camera shouldn't be that far away because it flattens the face out. Rule of thumb, there. So why rule it there? Because it happened to be there. Right. I'm, you know, I'm being, and also, yeah, okay, we can come in closer. And now I'm gonna bugger myself up with flare. 
Well, that's about where it should be, and it's about a 70 mil. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a bit looser than that. So that's not far off rule of thumb position. Let's just slide that over in the background so we've got a solid background. It's on that side of it. That's silver on that side. I don't think we'll use that. Uh, yeah. So this wants to come in front of this. Now, I would normally use a 4x4, four four, and you'd put it in so it spreads and fills the whole thing. Just hold it. This is just for softening it off if you want to make someone look away. Yeah, we're getting flare now from the back. But basically, diffuse it, move it in closer. How much does the like, diffusion distance to the light source it, That's not so much of a problem. The, what you need is the, what's the biggest influence is the width of the light source to the subject. So if you were to move that closer to me, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. So you're right on the edge of frame it becomes a much softer source and much more flattering. And that's what you're after. Generally, you want a flattering light source. Now, if you're doing a fashion shoot and you want some, that's not too bad. If you want someone and you're using the background backlight because you're not putting it in yourself, in reality, I would use a silver reflector back where that window is to put this kick that's coming in I would actually generally be putting in with a reflector from here, kicking that back. Go. Cool. You know, when you say like fashion, what like catch it, um, where like fashion is sort of catwalks, so yeah. Um, often the light will be quite harsh because. Yes, it will. People, why, why is that? As to it's to make them stand out. I, I used to do a lot of fashion work yeah. and use overlapping hard sources as they walk down. Yeah. It's to make them bright, shiny, and That's you can't right. use big, big soft sources. Um, but if you're doing a fashion shoot, that's how you would do a fashion shoot. Um, if you're doing a beauty shoot, you want to put that down for a second? You'll come to move this. In fact, let's... No, I can't. Let's move it to directly behind the camera. We'll have to lose this flag, unfortunately. The light, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I can't focus, by the way. So I have people who do that for me. You'll hear a constant um, refrain. I was asked years ago when I was doing a workshop that how do I remember all the settings on the cameras? And I said, it's very simple. I use the, um, the voice activated option. I'm gonna have to lose that. And they were all going, what's the voice activated option? This is when I was in Australia and Lexi was my assistant's name. And I went, dead easy. You activate the voice, act you know, there's a voice activated option on this. No, there isn't. I went, Lexi, set it to whatever. And it happened. It's like, you use the voice activated option. But that's what you do. I don't need to know how these are set up. I mean, I do, but you don't have to. So, a standard beauty one, and this is where you get really pedantic and really classic Hollywood lighting is straight down the line. If you look at the 1940s uh, Hollywood stuff, it is like that. Um, but what they'll do then is diffuse the lens to hell. You'll use nets and flags either side. So what you would do, because then actors used to hit their marks. Now, to quote a friend of mine about a very famous short male actor, hit his mark, you're lucky if he's in the same fucking room. You can figure out who that is yourself. Ah, damn. <laughs> yes, it is. So, but what they would do, and I'm going to do an extreme version of this. Where am I going? Fucking hell. There. I'm going to have to. This is a cameraman's lift. This is what electricians call a cameraman's lift because you have to lift it on the first stage first because otherwise you have to bring it down to bring it back up. So you always lift a flag or a light 
on the first section of a stand because then you can move it up early, easily. So that's what they would be doing on a face, is darting off the top. But that's way too hard and you move it closer to the lamp to make it softer, if I can get it. No, because I'd be lighting that totally separately. I'm just cheating here and just doing a shorthand. So you do it like that. Um, but you would also, as I say, this would be diffused as hell. You'd have a net on it or a double fog or um, there's all kinds of stuff I use. I particularly like, my favorite is Christian Dior, 10 denier black silk stockings. And on the camera, no, <laughs> That's what I use on the back of the camera, back of the lens. Um, they look, you know, there's no question that they are great at softening off a face. I'm only gonna do this in shorthand. I'm not gonna spend the time getting it right. It's just to give you a rough idea. Next thing you'd do with hard ones is you'd bring them in diagonally on either side of the face, softly, forward. <laughs> So you do that on both sides of the face and you narrow the face in. Yeah, yeah. They, they would be angled in like that. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing this very quickly to give you the idea. And again, you'd be using soft light as fill, but you'd also be using the level of diffusion they put on actually fills itself. Um, so the next stage is you get into the 20th century late half of the 20th century, and you do the same lighting, but this comes in. And you fly it across the top of the camera. Just put it in sideways. Hang on. No. Like so, and up. So it's almost resting on the lens. We're getting too much flare from the background for you to, you know, it's lighting up the top of the head, but it gives you an idea that that is classic soft beauty lighting. It's really simple, but it gets even better. What you do next is get rid of that. Pardon? And it looks like a baby that. <laughs> Shh, I used to do it now. Um, I'll tell you a story. While we're getting rid of that, can you put the china ball on this lamp, please? Um, I used to do L'Oreal and I also used to do Japanese for artistry was the product name. And I remember a client looking at the video assist monitor, shooting on film, but looking at video assist saying, you're making her skin look really good. It's quite incredible. Um, well, this is the whole point that I was looking at and going, if I can't make a 14 year old skin look good, at which point the model goes, I'm 15 next week. That's how you get good skin on a cosmetics commercial. It's a simple fact of life. Um, okay? And just get that directly into the back of the camera. Get it as close as you can to the camera and over the camera. Can someone help me with a couple of chairs, please? I'm gonna try and raise this up so we get, it'll probably fall over. All right, we're gonna need something to prop the back of it up, aren't we? Uh, there's another stand there. Not the one with the black on, but that one. It's got another decent hole. Ah, okay, uh, bollocks. Oh, there's another one there. Ah, hang on, while I'm looking at the monitor. Your way or my way? My way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. a little bit further. Uh, yeah. There we go, great. So we just put the rod out, so it's, um, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Which bag? I'll let you deal with it. I'm not touching, I don't touch things. Good God, man. Um, I was once did an interview about why I like being a cameraman rather than you know, what was the best thing about moving up in the grades? 
And I said, I'll never have to touch a metal box again in my life, um, which is absolutely true. So in this case, we've got backlight, we've got a soft light over camera, and it's way too high for a beauty light. What you would do, oh fucking hell, you wouldn't do that. You would, hmm. it's all right, I'll get there. And what you have to do is get really pedantic about it and you get, oops, handbar, no wonder it wouldn't move. It's all right, I've got hold of it, it won't fall over. Um, and you get it directly down the center line of the camera. And then depending on how, how rough the person in front looks, and in this case, pretty rough, <laughs> you move the light further and further down. So you'll come down and down to... Is that fine? That's great, thank you. To that. Next stage on that. Make your mind up how you're sitting. <laughs> Next stage on that is to narrow the face, which will take two blacks. You're in a better position than I am. I've picked a very bad position for this. So you get it as close to the side of the face as you can, but still out of shot, obviously. Still too much light coming in from behind. Yeah, it's getting better. Stand is, but the flag isn't. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So all I've been doing there is, I mean, the, the amount of backlight that's in there is, is causing trouble, but the whole idea is you narrow down the face by bringing the blacks in closer and closer. And you'd use as big a black as you possibly could to do that. Eyes forward. Stop looking over that way. <laughs> so you can see it's actually darkening off that part of his cheeks and just starting to pull it down in level. If you use bigger ones and you haven't got the backlight, you get it in even further. So the other thing you'd be doing in this case, which we haven't got, um, I'll just talk it through, is that this is getting too dark under here. And so you'd put a, a sheet of poly here or a specialist reflector under here to kick back up into there. Yeah, yeah, please. I've actually got what looks like a, a music um, stand, which has a center section that's shaped like that, and then two wings that are the same shape that swing in and out. And you put those on a stand there, and then you build the reflection in here. And the sides, you'd use bigger ones than this, about four foot square or even bigger, to suck the sides of the face in. The, the, the sunbathing ones, yeah, exactly that, but with um, soft material on them rather than, yeah. Any size? Any size. <laughs> we'll start with a small one and see what happens. Oh yeah, I mean, it's not a question of in the books or this is how I shoot. Yeah. Um, but this is how, coming from a fashion background, this is how the majority of people doing fashion shoot. Would it, Go on. I was going to say, would it differ if the background of the subject would be black? Like it would make life a lot easier. <laughs> um, but that's not there. So, hang on, I'll do it. Because I'm not getting enough out of that. There's a bit coming in, but not enough. Got a shiny silver one. Ah, oh, what's that one on the, there? The one that's on the ground. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, we can go over that, or, or a bigger one. Oh, cool, that'll do. In fact, it looks like it's made for the job. 
Yeah, way too much. But you can see what... And of course the problem is that that is way too bright. I need to be halfway in between them. I need to be this, but... On top of that. Try it. Can I have that round one? I think that's going to bring just stuff in from the edges more, but we'll have a look. Yeah, that's about. So you can see you just soften that off if you want. It's not hard. You'd normally be struggling with getting a backlight on the hair, but of course we're not on this because it's built in. Um, any questions so far? If this is obviously quite close up, so if yeah. you're doing something where someone, you're wanting the whole body... Same as you do, space, just bigger. bigger yeah. yeah. Um, cool. How would it differ if they were wearing glasses? The reflection of the skull, would that be a completely It can be a problem. It depends. Um, and what you do is... These are <coughs> ultra-coated and so shouldn't reflect, uh, he said confidently. I'm going to try and... No. Uh, wrong angles. Excuse me? I'm just going to try my specs in there oh, yeah. and see if they reflect. But not a huge reflection. Yeah. No. I mean, they are highly coated to stop reflections, and that's one of the things you need to make sure that the actors have. Um, but, you know... There are compromises you have to make at times that that's where you would put a beauty light. I wouldn't put that there for a man. That's purely, I mean, we're doing it on a man, but it's purely where you would generally do a woman light like that. A man, you would make the light much higher. And if we want to try and do a classic, the one I was talking about, the, the meatloaf look, the fish fryer, you can kind of do with that. Another volunteer to sit in front of the camera? Or do you want to go back? Can we get the stand to sort of here, so I can get the lamp up there. We can lose the black, or leave the blacks there, what the hell. So I'm doing this on a very small scale, simply because it's easy. We'll come even further forward. Okay, and now take it up. And keep going up. Whoop, hold it there. Just look up towards camera. Okay, that's a smidgen, smidgen too high. Just bring it down, bring it down. And look at the camera. There, there's just enough in the eyes. So you're trying to adjust it to an angle where it just gets into the, there, into the top of the eyes. So if you look up now, there. And that's a classic... Yeah, it should be bang over the top. That's what you would try and do. That's a classic way that Bailey, for example, does portraits. But it's the way that, well, it's a very 60s fashion photographer look, but that everyone uses. Yeah. Um, dead simple. You know, all the lighting, all lighting is really simple. Yeah. And again, the blacks are having an effect there as well as the top because it's bringing the sides of his face in even further and makes him look like a moody bastard you know, which is probably what you want um, same lamp let's take the blacks out the side for the moment get them out of the way um, I brought the panel light in on an arm because I was going to use it as a backlight but we kind of got one from God for that so we won't worry can we move this now round to here? Just slide this round to the side. And keep going round, keep going round, keep going round. Okay, hold it there and bring it down a touch. Keep going, there. And then, ah.
There. One light again, totally different look. But it's the male superhero look again. And that's why I was saying about moving a china ball around, that you use the one lamp and you move its position and it stays, it gives you the look that you're after. And if he would look up very slightly, till you, there you go, you, the light goes in his eyes. The whole thing is to position it so you get the kick in the eyes. Because if you haven't got a catch light in the eyes, the person looks dead. You need to do it in a way that will get you that ping. So that's why I was saying to move it down a touch. And that was when I was doing meatloaf where the camera crew were going, you know, docker camera and, whoosh, um, and hated the way I was lighting. You'll never see his eyes, it's too dark. And I'd watched meatloaf perform. I'd watched videos of him, I'd you know, seen him live. And I knew that as soon as he started singing, just tip your head back slightly. That's what he did. <laughs> And so while you were doing setups, his eyes looked too dark. As soon as he started singing, his head tipped back and the light went in his eyes. And it worked fine. So you need to look towards camera and just... Okay, we need to... Oh, it's actually okay. We've got a catch light in the eyes there. And if you look at anything I've shot, you'll always see a catch light in the eyes. I hate dead eyes. And the... In the olden days in Hollywood, they would put a light, it's called an obi light, um, on camera to light up the eyes, to make a kick in the eyes. And I've put a peanut bulb on the mat box just to put a ping in the eyes, but I hate doing that. I want to get the ping in the eyes from the light source because it looks much more natural. Now, everything I've done here is what you would do on a big one, just bigger. All you would do is, can someone grab hold of that for me? Thank you. All you would do is that would grow from that to a 20 by and you'd back it off. It's inverse square law, so you double the distance, has to be four times the size. <laughs> well, it's not maths, it's really easy. So is it really that? Inverse square law is double the distance, four times the size. You can manage that. So if you go from two feet to four feet, it needs to be, you know, it's really, and it's the same with light levels, that as the light gets further away from someone, you need to increase the level of it, but it's the inverse square law again. That's a really important basic thing to learn. I know it's maths, I know everyone, I'm an artist. If you know a little bit of maths, just a little bit of the technical side, you can save yourself a lot of pain because you can work out what light level you need at different distances. Now, there's a really important piece of kit I've got in my bag. I've actually got two important pieces of kit in this bag. This one for location, this one for studio. I use all kinds of predictive software as I was showing people at lunchtime. But if all your batteries fail, this has a compass built into it and you can tell what, where the sun's gonna be at any time of day. And it has an inclinometer built into it and you can see what angle the sun's gonna be at. And you know for car commercials, you want the sun below 10 degrees on the horizon and you work out what time of day that's gonna be and where it needs to be. But on this, it's an exposure meter. And nobody uses them because I can see it on a monitor. Well, the whole thing is that works while you're on low budget stuff. But as soon as you start to get a budget, you're going to have to pre-light stuff. You're not going to have a camera and a monitor to set the lights up with. You're going to have to work it out. So what you want to do is what lighting ratio do I want? Do I like the balance of that? Is the sh are the shadows too dark in that, or am I comfortable with that? So I'm comfortable with that. That's reading eight and a half in the highlights. And four in the shadows, two and a half stops. Fucking hell, that's about what I normally like to. <laughs> two and a half, three stops. And that's, so you know immediately that that will look right. That will be the balance you're used to. 
and you can move on to the next shot and pre-light. Learn to use a meter. Please. Apart from anything else, if you need to match a whole series of shots, that's how you match them. That's how you get the contrast the same. Not watching a monitor, because the monitor could be set up wrongly. You could have ambient light on the monitor, all kinds of stuff. That tells you the truth. Will you record then, like after every scene, then just in case you need to go back for like pickup shots or something? Or... I do drawings. Right. I'm old school. No, I grab frames as well. But I use a digital camera. Um, I use a Canon Reflex. I've got it lined up. I've calibrated it now against the cameras. So if I set it to 800 ISO, which this is, and I set it to a 50th of a second, the stop that I get on the camera is roughly what I'll get when I'm shooting for real. So when I did Street Fighter, which was shot on film, we calibrated the daily scans, and then I calibrated my camera to match the daily scans, so I could shoot stills, and I had a setting in Lightroom that gave me the, the look that I was after, and that was every day I was grabbing loads of frames um, of the grade. And it's still up on my website somewhere, if you can find it. If you know where it is, you can find it. I can't even remember the address of it now. Um, but it is there. And there's a, a whole guide of eight, ten pages for the colorist with frames grabbed to show eight pictures per page. And then goes up to full frame if you want them, of, of references. But generally, the best way to do it is that. Because if I know that I've got two and a half stops key to fill on it, then I can reproduce that again and again and again without even looking at the picture, just taking the readings. You look at it once, get it right, and from then on you match it. Now I know that sounds incredibly old school, but as I say, when you move out of mega cheap, mega low budget stuff, you're gonna to need to know how to do that. Not only that, if you're doing a recce on a low budget thing, you need to know how much light you're gonna need. You need to know whether you can shoot in there. Can I shoot at that end of the room without a, meet, without a camera? Can I shoot him? Just. 2.5. Not calibrated to this camera, but let's have a look. No, 2.8, but it won't go any further than 2.8. So a third of a stop open on that, looks about right. Use a meter. <laughs> that gave me eight, I think, was the key reading. I'll pull the mic out of my pocket. Eight. Sorry? So that would mean you need aperture eight. Yeah. So let's try it. I've just got a reading of eight. That's eight on the monitor. Just look to the camera. A little bit dark, but it's, you know. As I say, I haven't calibrated to that camera, so I don't know. And that's what you always do, you test. And you clear all the memories. Uh. When you say calibrate, is that just, do you put into that? I get a grayscale, I take a reading, and I put it on a monitor. So I get the picture looking right on a calibrated monitor. And I've got a seven inch Odyssey, which I always take with me, record a monitor. It's my reference monitor. I get it looking right on that. Then I look at what the stop is, what the camera theoretically is 800. And I then go and take a reading. If it gives me a different reading, I build an offset into this. I can set it to slight variations. I build the offset into this, and then whatever I take the reading on this, it's going to be the same. How long does that take? Minutes. Oh. I mean, really minutes. You do that at the beginning of a shoot. Once you've got the camera set up and you know what you're doing, and that's it. You don't touch it again. Because if you alter anything, you're going to screw it up. So you set it to a standard. And in fact, looking at the You know, about half a stop out. So I would just build in a half stop 
offset in this, I'm done. And then from then on, I'm taking readings and it's, it's right. You can get, you don't have to spend 600 quid on a meter either. Um, you can get still the old Seconic one that I got back in 1968, um, which is an old selenium type one. It's not digital. It's got a selenium cell that measures the amount of electricity generated by the cell. Needle moves across. It's about 100 quid. It's still a really good meter. And it's, you know, it's simple to use. So, questions? No, no questions? Go on. A book light? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure we've got enough to do it. Different effects. Um, in case you don't know what a book light is, and I use them a lot, um, great thing on cosmetics with a book light is, and this is just madness, but what I would do is I would use a 20 foot silk like that. Model would be there, the silk would be doing that, going all the way up there. Then in here at an angle like this would be a reflector bounce reflector, again 20 foot, and back over there would be a big lamp firing into the bounce which then goes through, so it's softer than soft, it's diffused bounce light. And by bringing it forward like this, it comes right up to camera in fact, it then wraps around, the, it's side lighting, but it's side lighting that wraps around the face, it's gorgeous, it's absolutely gorgeous. I'll try and reproduce that in a second actually, come on, sorry, there was a, yeah. Too many lights. Too many lights. Too many lights. The man in the sky does it with one. Um, even though I don't believe in the man in the sky, that's beside the point. Um, you're used to seeing stuff lit with one lamp. Sun. Um, hard or soft, depending on if it's overcast or not. It's a really good way to work. I mean, the lighting on you now is quite attractive. And it's just soft light bounced in. You know, it's same light on him, same light on... It's quite nice light. It's one light source, just soft light bouncing in through there. Let's try and do a... Hmm. How do we do a book light? We're going to need an extra diffu uh, reflector. Have we got another one of these? We don't have any that size, no. You've got them smaller or bigger? Uh, smaller. Bugger. Okay. Another one of those would be good. Um... Okay, all we do is we, we cheat it. We move it so that that's the background. Camera comes here. And it's up against the wall, mother. One of my favorite lines from a song from 69. Yep, yeah, you're somewhere there. You should be from the film plane. Yeah, it's about there. A bit close to the background, but you'll do. Okay, have we got a diffuser for that? No, we don't need a diffuser for that one. We'll use that one. Now, this is where it's going to get difficult because I want to run this one sideways if I can. I want to run it like that. But, hang on, you want to be this side? Don't go anywhere. I'm going to cheat and use the sun as well. So what we want to do is get that there somehow. <laughs> I'll let you work on that. That one then needs to come at an angle here. And that needs to go into hard mode. Chairs? Uh, yeah, we'll use the white side of that. This lamp will have that taken off and it will go over there. I'm 
not sure that's going to be high enough. In fact, it's not going to be high enough. Can we put that black case on the chairs? And lift that to there, that'll be perfect. So we just need to put a stand in to hold that in place. Now normally you would have um, half a dozen slaves working for you. Depends, varies enormously. Um, on some it might just be a gaffer and one electrician. Uh, my record is 137 electricians. So, um, no, um, because they're working on multiple sets, and um, they're organised. You know, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the size of crew varies hugely. On something like Wallander, I had a gaffer and two, so three people on lighting. Um, but you also then have the stands, the clamps, the stuff you need to do it quickly and efficiently. And if you're doing the same kind of setup every day, it becomes very fast, yeah. Are we okay on that? Cool. That one, whoops, nope. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with that <laughs> because you've got a problem. Uh, doing it that way, you're gonna have to do it with a flag arm. If you take the soft light off the flag arm because this is gonna go here. And that reflector is going to go diagonally into the end of this one. And this should be further along there like that. Who asked for a book light? Okay, I've let go of this, it's all yours now. Yeah, that's going to be a problem because yeah, that, that needs to go right into that corner. So you're going to have to actually try and clamp it at this end. Can you take the stand out? Stay where you are with that. That needs to be there. This needs to go like that. I think we're going to end up just holding this in place. So that does that. That goes through there. And your victim sits here. We'll get the standard victim in. If I hold this, can you take your seat, please? I'm going to have a job lining the camera up while I hold this, of course, but there you go. This is good fun. <laughs> Whee! Dead artist. Thank you. Yeah. Now let me see first. That way I know if I screwed up. Yeah, we're just doing that. <laughs> and then, as I haven't, <laughs> screwed up, that is. Having fun. So, can you see it on the monitor? Anyone? 
No one can see the monitor. So as you can see, it's a very, very soft light from the side. You then come in. Oh, fuck. Jesus Christ, Boyle. Why don't you watch where you're going? Fuck. Always put a half tennis ball or a tennis ball on the end of a a stand, because otherwise people will walk into it and put their eyes out. And soften it off even more. Because that hides everything. You get no detail in the skin at all. Um, When you're getting some poor detail in there. Ah, you do that in post. Or you do it in the cameras. The cameras have a setting in them of skin detail, um, TV cameras. And you wind the skin detail down. Or some of them have a kind of diffusion you can build into them. And you crank that up, skin tone only. Um, and one of the things that's really important now is to learn what you can do in post. Um, to save you time when you're shooting. Because you don't fix it in post, you finish it in post. Um, and I hate the phrase, fix it, oh, we'll fix that in post. But I think as a DP now, you have to understand what can and can't be done in post. And you have to understand how you can save... Bloody hell, that was dodgy. Um, you have to understand how you can save time on a shoot um, by doing stuff in post. So if I wanted to, for example, darken down this shot, it would require quite a big black, quite a big, you know, object to stop that. Mm. Whereas in post, I can put a wipe in yeah. and just lose it in, in seconds. Um, so I need to understand I can do that. I need to understand that I can use something called Beauty Box, uh, which is software designed for aging American actresses, uh, which will airbrush their faces. And what that will do is you pick out basically the skin tone, say here, and you dial in the amount of pores you want. It, it literally has a P-O-R-E-S control, plus and minus. It's really simple. Only in skin tone. Um, it's uh, a multiple kind of keying level. It looks at the colour, the brightness, and so on. Oh yeah, very much so. Um, I always shoot log. I would never shoot anything other than log, um, because basically, if you're not shooting, and you've got quite a nice eye light on this as well, it looks kind of non-lit. Now, in reality, I would move this even further this way to get, so let's just try moving this up this way a bit. Keep this one where it is. Because if the bounce comes from further this way, it should then round more, maybe. Um, yeah, it also needs to be higher. The whole lot needs to be higher, but we don't have the hardware to do that. But you would do that on a movie with big reflectors because then you can cover a whole area and people can move around and you don't have a problem with lighting and matching it. Because at the moment, I don't like what it's doing here. You're getting light coming up here and I think light coming up from a nose is really blech. So you really need to lift everything up by half a meter probably. Uh, it would help, yes, and it would help if you were to... Yeah, but we need to get this then. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get stuff over the top of it then. This reflector isn't high enough or big enough is the problem then. That you need to raise this up with it, but then it's going to come over the top and get him. The whole lot needs to come up. Yeah, there you go. Whoop. And then the lamp needs to come up as well. Uh, 
like that. And that should be looking better. Yeah. Happy with that. So you'd then put a kicker in of some kind. Um, there. Just lifting out that cheek from behind. I can't see what I'm doing, but I can see. Is that working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, you know, the approach you'd take. You can rest now, guys. No, but I'd love another coffee. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not shaking. I'm not, you know, not wound up enough. Okay, have a seat. We'll get this out of the way. What else can I show you? What do you want to know? What have you seen that you'd like to reproduce? I mean, do you want me to, I can show you. The classic one with this is pouring water, pouring wine into a, a glass. The, the perfect way to do wine, um, which is one of the ones that Northern Film School looked at my reel and went, ha, do that with cheap shit. Like, yeah, all right. <laughs> That would be a, a soft source round to three quarters yeah. and just and a kicker backlight. Okay. Um, when we do the when I do the cook ones, they're been basically. Do you want to? You would have. If I'm doing cook, they tend to be there or there. The same, you know. It's that. That's what you need to learn to do one side or the other. Um, it needs to be that far away. That's the optimum face distance. You know, real shorthand, but it, it's the stuff that gets you out of grief very quickly. So if we put the ball back on that. And if we can change that lens for, have we got something around a 50? Yeah. 25 to 40 zoom, something like 25 to 104 zoom, rather. One, whatever the hell it is. I can never remember. Yeah. By moving up here, it's quite good actually because we've moved away from the influence of that. Uh, hang on. Right, so we need to set that to a 50 ish. Might be a 65, but it's about a 50. Um, and that needs to go up there. It depends. Sometimes I do, yeah. I mean, I find it convenient, you know, and fast just to sit here and go, no, up there. Because if you, it depends if you're doing an interview where someone's going to come in later. You want to be actually, if, all right, interview. This is a key interview. Even further around there, please. Interviewer is going to be there, that side of camera. So I'm going to be looking like that. That's about right, I think. Well, what does it look like? Tell me. So on this side, which is why you'd have <laughs> trying to balance it against the chair. Sorry. Thank you. Silver side round. Is there a silver side on that? So it kicks back as a backlight more. Because I don't want to get so much fill on this, I just want to get a rim light on it. 
use the other one, yeah. You're gonna mess the camera up, never mind. I mean, all the time we're struggling with the amount of daylight that's coming in, you know, which is, it's fine. That's a real life situation. And the silver side of that, please. Or actually the white that close will be, that's good. Just use that side, but you don't wanna be that far forward with it. Just tip it back and you're in shot as well. So just swing the back end out that way. You're well in shot with it. <laughs> <laughs> you need to kind of do it more like that. You want to keep this side of the face quite dark, but establish, yeah, you're still in shot. <laughs> Go on, keep going. Keep going. There. Okay. That's probably come around too far now. You'll probably need to black that bit out. Um, so I'm talking there. It feels to me like there's too much fill in from there now. Enough coming from the back. Yeah, I will. <laughs> oh, no, that's not bad, actually. So, yeah. So you're looking at me and talking to me. So, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, you're there. You may want to make that slightly hard, get more into that side of the face. If you do, you either angle that side back a bit. And it, <laughs> you're in a cave. Uh, and you may need to bounce something off this to use an additional lamp. But I try to do it as fast as I can with one lamp. Well, I quite like that, actually. And talk to me. Yeah, there you go. Terrific interview light. If you wanted to go for like a different... You know, like you see those like uh, plane documentaries where everyone's died and they always look really sad because of their family members. Death. <laughs> 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 you know, you, sorry, I am going somewhere with this. Well, yeah. you know, I interviewed all the survivors of the Manchester plane crash. So then, did you know, like a thing where you, you kind of affect the lighting to make it look more solemn and like, and sad and less fill light? Less, yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah. That was the point. That's all you do. Just less fill light. Okay, um, so less. That's stuff yeah, I mean, you know, it's just keep the backgrounds dark, keep them, and just, oh, thanks. And, you know, you just make it all miserable looking. Yeah, okay, so then you, if, and you do the opposite if there was something really positive. That you you make, make it happy and bright and, yeah. and shiny. So what you would do then is bring this one round to here. And you have even further round. Just slide it right towards camera. Just bring that into camera. There you go. Happy, shiny people. Everywhere. Um, and just look up here. A bit further around that way. There you go. So all you're doing is playing with that, and that you could just move further away or closer. And you've got the... I mean, generally when I'm moving and shooting, it's something like this, and a sheet of... I've actually got a 4x4 four four version of one of these that's on a stand, and you just backwards and forwards, and you're there. I don't shoot dockers anymore, but that's how I used to shoot them. So would you say it's better to go by the moment to follow the exposure guide? I don't use the exposure guide in the video. I use my meter. <laughs> but yes, if you want to do consistent, if you've got one that has false colour, and you know the false colour is where you want the false colour to be, and it may not be in the right place for what you want, then, yeah, false colour, and you use that to match the skin tone. You pick one piece of skin tone, and I generally pick there, just under that eye on the bright side. Is that because it's quite the focal point, which are the eyes normally? Yeah, and that's where you would actually try and match the exposure from interviewee to interviewee, bearing in mind that there is an effect of skin tone. Um, you know, and darker skins can be two stops under, and you just bear that in mind. Um, you don't, one of the things that drives me crazy is people who use extra light on black skins. And I think that's just nonsense because the skins are darker. I was just looking around to see if there's anyone here, but there's not. Um, and one of my favorite doing camera tests with uh, Kodak in their factory in Chalon, we used to go and test new stocks there. And I would go around the factory and get them to get me the best test when we're doing the first release of 8.7. 
which was the first low contrast stock they did. They called it the stonewashed look. Um, and we went around the factory and we found a Nigerian guy and a Danish woman because he was the darkest guy we could find and she was the lightest woman we could find. And we put them together on a night exterior and lit them exactly the same. And then went, can the film handle it? But wasn't there like a big controversy about how like, the films back then were only suitable for... They still are. I mean, the, the films you get now are optimised for Caucasian skin. But then you go back to the 1970s, the end of the 1970s, and the first Sony cameras that came out inside had a matrix setting, which was Asian skin or Caucasian skin. And it changed the matrix settings according to the, who you're shooting. That was taken out because of the outcry about it. I found that ridiculous because if you get a better setting for a particular skin, then you use it. I don't give a shit what color someone is. The one thing you have to bear in mind is that with a white skin, you're often trying to take reflection out of the skin and mat them down, or not too much because it looks ludicrous if they get too matte. BBC still used makeup that was designed for SD television on HD and they look fucking ludicrous. Um, but like when I was doing Michael Clark Duncan, who's pretty dark, I'm not gonna put extra light on to make him lighter because that just doesn't make him right. What I do is talk to the makeup artist and we use make him shiny and then put lights in place to reflect in his skin. Just like an oil base or something like that. Yeah. Just catch light. Olive oil, <laughs> a lot of the time, seriously. Um, baby oil, you know, it, it's just anything that will catch the light. Yeah. But he's still, when he hasn't got those highlights, the skin is black, yeah. which is what it should be. Because you need, you need that to define the talent when shooting in the shadows, for example. Like exactly, that, like yeah. You don't want to have the classic teeth and eyes, you know, you, want to be able to see the rest of him. And you've got to be able to talk to people like that and not be self-conscious about it, you know, because, yeah. And you've got to learn to be upfront, but nicely upfront. Just be very matter of fact about it. There was a scene uh, when we're shooting in Mutant Chronicles where the director freaked out because one of the actresses, Anna, had to drop her robe in it shot from behind. You're only seeing from here up. Um, but obviously, she was exposed. So, how do I do this, Jeff? How do I do it? You just, Anna, drop it. And in the end, he couldn't shoot it because he couldn't take it as a matter of fact. And I shot it for him. I directed that scene. And he... What did he mean by like he couldn't take it? Is that like... Well, he didn't know how to talk to... Her. He right. was really conscious about... He's talking to a woman about taking her clothes off and was really uncomfortable about it. And if you're uncomfortable about it, it makes everyone uncomfortable. So you just go in and you go, okay, face that way. And when I give you the cue, drop it, just drop it. Okay, Anna, and stand by turnover and drop it. Didn't come off quite properly. Do another one. And you just talk like that. Done. You've got the, one of my favorite ever, which women tend to like, was a Levi's commercial directed by Terry Donovan. And he got all the women members of the crew. So continuity, makeup. Um, that makeup was generally a guy on those, but it was a woman on that. And it was the whole thing of, okay, we need to pad out his jeans. You all talk about what's he look like? Is that the right shape? Is he hung enough? It was just like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, because that's how he treated female models with clothes. Do they fit? Do they work in the right place? And so he did exactly the same with blokes. And it was wonderful to see because you had people going, I can't do that. Why not? It's exactly, you just, and as a cameraman, you have to be, camera person, you have to be totally switched off to that. You cannot see what you're shooting. And it's quite weird that people have said to me about the Robert Palmer ones, you know, how oh, must amazing, you know, working with all those models. And you know, how, like, well, actually, when you're shooting, they are to, again, quote Donovan, meat puppets. And you're not looking at them as people. They're not sexual objects. They're bits of flesh that you're lighting. They are meat puppets. And I know it sounds weird, but you don't see them. You don't see them in the terms of people. You see them as a problem. Is that light okay? Is that, well, is that shadow there? 
you know, and that's what you're thinking about. It's quite incredible, but you do just not think about it at all. And that then takes you to shooting in war zones as a documentary cameraman. And you have to be able to switch off because you see things that if you couldn't switch off, you couldn't function. Yeah. And you tend not to talk or think about them because it gets messy, except the silly ones. Yeah. My favourite... My favourite story to come out of it was the border war between Oman and Yemen, where we had Iranian troops there and Jordanian troops, as well as British Army, British Army training team, who are actually SAS, and the Royal Engineers there and all kinds of stuff. And the Iranians played rugby with a live landmine, and it went off. And one of the field surgical team guys, MASH in American terms, that's what everyone knows, came running up to me, Jeff, Jeff, you've got to make a commercial. And he's holding an arm up. I said, it's a Seiko, it's still ticking, you should make a commercial. Oh, fucking hell, mate. <laughs> but that's how they deal with it. That's, you know, the, the, the black humour. They, the first thing they do when you meet them is get a beer, it's in the fridges. The fridges are actually the bodies. You slide out the, and it's like, Jesus. And they keep all the beers cold around the bodies. Well, it's how they deal with it. It becomes a joke. It becomes some, not a joke, but you just, you know, you wash it over. And you see shit. You know, you see, you see unpleasant things at times. But you see great things as well. You know, so it's a, and you don't have to do the war zone stuff. You know, it's up to you whether you do or not. Um, but I think it's worth doing a whole mixture of work and if you're doing serious documentary work, you're going to end up in somewhere like that. And you just, you know, go with it. But again, it's the whole thing. And there's a really interesting thing that there's a whole series of, um, used to be on the net and I've lost it. It's a cameraman filming their own deaths. Because one thing you have to be really, really careful about in an area that's dodgy, and that could be a war zone, it could be an area where there's, just a gang area where it's not, you know, good, is that becomes a barrier. And anything in front of it isn't real. And there's some great footage from South America of someone going, no. And he pulls a gun out and he waves it, no. And then you see the guy point it and the camera just goes backwards. Because the, it's not real. It's not happening through the viewfinder. And, you know, that's an extreme case, but that happens with hanging out the back of a car. I was doing a BMW commercial with, uh, oh, I can't remember who the driver was, Formula One driver anyway. And I'm looking in the viewfinder and he comes whoosh, through shot. And I kept saying, can you come a bit closer? Can you come a bit closer? And finally, on a fourth take or so, he said, would you please do a take with a camera locked off where you're not looking through the viewfinder and you actually see how close I'm coming to you? Shit, uh, no closer, <laughs> because you've got no idea. And North Sea shot, I was doing helicopter, sitting in the side, side mount, feet on the skids. And I keep going lower, lower to the pilot. I said, take your eye away from the monitor and look where we are. Holy shit. <laughs> you know, you've, he's gone way below his comfort zone. Yeah, totally. And also, it's not real. You see this dramatic shot, and it's getting more and more dramatic the lower you get. And it's like, I'm after the shot. You know? And it, this was one um, for a North Sea oil rig. And we were shooting. It's been used by British Gas and all kinds of people, library footage. It's a really low-flying shot across the sea towards a rig. And it is unbelievably low. And, you know, I didn't realise how low we were when we shot it. I'd never have shot it if I'd seen what I was shooting. But, so that's... You know, I know it's nothing to do with lighting, but it's the whole thing of, you need to be aware of how comfortable people are in front of the camera. You need to remember to talk to the model in front of the camera. Because I've just been ignoring our model. And our model is getting fed up because no one's, our model is sitting there and being ignored by everyone. And that's what happens. And your actress, actor, sits there going, and gets looking like that. And so you go up and you go, and get your coffee or anything, you know, we're going to take ages, it's so fucking boring, I know, but, and you talk to them, you engage them as people, because that's really important, 
because you've got to keep contact with them. Because if you lose contact, the, the eyes become dead. The whole thing just becomes dead. And you've got to keep a relationship going the whole time. So that's six and five. Everything is there, but having that connection yeah. it makes it all different. It does. And it's that whole, you've got to be aware of them as people because it really is easy to think of them as meat puppets. But then in contrast to that, you just said a minute ago that you have to see them almost as... And yeah, you do. And it's that weird balance yeah. that... You've got to, when you stop, you're then able to speak to this person. Yeah, on, exactly. Like a, yeah. 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 And it's difficult. It's, you know, to switch both ways. Yeah. It's that whole balance of, of being aware that they're human beings, but also meat puppets. Um, I did a shoot one, and during the shoot, the, the uh, photographer was a horrible, he was really not nice. Mm. Whilst, we're, you know, he'd be like telling me exactly, in a really horrible way, and yeah. to move forward. And then as soon as you stopped, you'd be like, oh, this is great. This is Know, reboost your morale mm. again and then, and then, take and then smash you down again, again. yeah, yeah. Before you know, I hate happened. that I, I mean, it, it, was, it was an effective way of working but mm. when I saw it it was like I could see how he was going with it because he'd break down and then it's a very 60s kind of approach yeah. and I think yeah. it's just awful yeah. people have seen Bailey mm. and think they should be Bailey mm. and you know Bailey's a twat mm. sorry um, he doesn't like me either so it's fine uh, even though we shot together for two years and, you know, he disconnects himself from everything. We were shooting in, doing a McDonald's commercial, and he shot the whole thing on a 300mm lens. We actually had to have two studios at Pinewood to get him far enough away. So everything's being relayed through an assistant director. He's not talking to the people who are in shot. I ended up, he got really annoyed with me because he expected me to be by camera to talk to him. And... I was using video assist down near the artists so I could see what was happening on the shot he was doing and I could see what was happening to them in real life and I could talk to my gaffer close in and the models were, or the actors were aware that I was looking at them and trying to make them look good whereas he's half a mile away, you know, and it's just, you need a human contact um, because, and I mean, watching Terry Donovan work was quite interesting because he could be very hard and he could be very suggestive in his comments to the models but it was always very quietly done and whispered to them it wasn't done to embarrass them in front of everyone else it was just talk to them very quietly and you know like this think of your boyfriend doing this or whatever <laughs> it was like, did you really say that terry <laughs> fine but it worked because you'd get that few seconds of quirk there was what he was after, the face, you know. But again, that's personal. It's like they're still speaking to that person. Yeah. I mean, on that one with um, the Sega, with Steve O'Donnell, the how did he do that <laughs> shot was a, over 100 takes. Wow. Um, and it was fascinating to... And I was like, what the hell is Steve the actor, Steve the director? What the hell are they doing? And what Steve the director was doing was a little bit greasier, a little bit more Mexican make an aggressive, you know, gang in California. Nah, too far. Make it a bit... And you could see the performance just gradually shifting in the direction that got the result he wanted. But it was talk, 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 talk. And never lose the connection with the model or the actor or the, you know. And just... But it's difficult because you're under pressure and you just, you know, deal with the technical side. Because oh, I can't fucking cope with this, the sun's going down, the, you know. And you've got to move. And you have to learn to move quickly, but also talk to people. And I think that's really, really quite hard. Um, because you do focus on your problems and not on other people's. Yeah. Which ultimately is what you have to do. But there are ways to do it and ways not to do it. You need to make people in front of the camera feel like you give a shit, even if you don't. Because most of the time you don't. Most of the time you just want to get on with it and get out of there. You know, sorry, but it's true. No, I'm an artist. I care. It's a great concern. Yeah, right. Um, I'm doing it for the paycheck. 
Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're doing it to try and create a nice store. That's why I do low-budget European stuff now, because I, I don't do it for the paycheck anymore. I do it because I enjoy it. And it might be that I'm doing it because there's a technical thing I want to try out, and I want to get away with it on a low-budget film. It's one of the reasons I did music videos for a long time after they weren't really very profitable to do, either in terms of career or money, because you can do stuff on a music video, which if it goes wrong, you just go, oh no, that's a stylistic choice, that was deliberate. And everyone goes, oh great, because they'll believe the bullshit. Um, and it, music videos are a great way to, to experiment and, and play with stuff. And I'll just give you a story about that. Um, I was, I'd finished doing Diet Coke commercial, which ran over three weeks. Seven days a week for three weeks. Long, long days. And I turned around to the producer at the end of it and said, Sophie, what do you want me to bill? She looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, well, you obviously want a deal on this. You don't want rate card. And she said, no, it's Coke. It was them changing their minds that caused the overruns. Bill it rate card. I was like, holy shit. Um, and the rate card, between rate card and what I was going to bill them, was enough to pay for a three-week holiday in the Caribbean over Christmas. I was on the phone immediately booking a three-week holiday in the Caribbean over Christmas. Day before we were due to go away, my agent calls me and says, we've got a music video. I'm like, Sue, I'm going on holiday. Day after tomorrow, actually, not tomorrow. I don't want to do that. What is it anyway that's in the pump house? Oh, fuck, I'm not going to the pump house again. It's a shithole. Um, it's a motion control one. It's very you, Jeff. I don't want to do it. It's cash. You're going on holiday. It's your spending money for your holiday. How much is it? It's a grand till midnight. In cash? Yeah. Okay. What's the deal after midnight? 250 an hour. Okay. We get to midnight. The band's turned up late. They fucked around as they always do. They've been a pain in the arse. We've, we've done one shot. Motion control. The whole song in one shot, but, you know, very complicated move. Producer comes up to me and said, um, what do we do now? I said, well, you know the deal. Have you got another 250? I've actually not got any more money. I'm fine. Got my phone out to phone a cab. And he goes, what? I said, well, you know, you know what the deal is. That's what we agreed. He said, but how do I finish it? I said, well, that set's lit and that set's lit. If the crew will stay, the camera crew, you can shoot on those two sets and finish it. But I'm gone, unless you've got the extra money. I said, well, I haven't. Right, fine. I can have a cab to go from... He's looking at me like... Cab turns up and, you know... We had a deal. Deal's a deal. Um, and I go. I, hang on, I come back from a holiday and they've been phoning, trying to book me three times a week because anyone who treats them like that must be really good. You know. What point were you in your career then to be able to get 250 an hour? For someone to be like that, I'll pay you 250 for an hour, I'll pass it to I was. I was at the stage where you can get a grand buyout for a day and £250 an hour after midnight. <laughs> Sorry, I was... Yeah. I was, what, age? I was 45. Um, I'd been shooting commercials for... high-end commercials for 10 years at that point. Um, and... No. But some people it is. Some people are really, you know, I've done it slowly. Um, I've always argued that I have, you know, yeah, I didn't shoot. For, I get people talking to me who are 27 and who are heartbroken. It's all oh, I'm going to give up. I haven't shot a film yet. It's like, fucking hell. Um, and I'm kind of, I didn't shoot a film until I was 55. And at 27, well, all right, 25, I was still into sex and drugs and rock and roll and to hell with, you know, doing things seriously. I was having fun. You know, have a life. And, you know, there's that whole thing, oh, I've got to do it now, I've got to do it now. No, you haven't, you know. <laughs> it, yeah. Well, I grew up in that generation, you know, it's kind of, it was compulsory. Um, art school in the late 60s? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to 
it's like working with companies and people. A lot, mm. a lot of the times, like you put forward like an agreement, like, like would you ever do you sign agreements? Yes. Um, what happened during? Sorry, I'll, I'll jump ahead. Um, when I was doing music videos and most commercials, it was word of mouth. It was totally verbal agreements um, because they're short jobs, and there are accepted norms. Um, it's now moved much more into contracts on commercials, where your agent will get a contract signed. I didn't do that for most of the jobs. Um, but I was working with the same directors for, for years at a time. And that's the important thing, to build a relationship with directors and producers, because they're the people who, the producers are the people who hire you, the directors are the people who want the directors to hire you. So you need to have a working relationship with the producers and directors. Um, as far as contracts go on movies, it's really, really important. And it's really important to have a, an agent who either is a lawyer or who has, which most, well, all Hollywood agents are lawyers. Um, or you, in the English situation, you have an agent who has a lawyer that goes over your contracts. Because you'll find a situation, not that this ever happened to me, um, where you've done a deal, there's a contract, but it's not signed yet. And you're going over the details, and going over the details, going over the details, change the contract, change the contract. And the day before you start shooting, where I'd said, I'm walking away. If this contract's not signed, I am walking away. And they've got the front pages have exactly what you'd agreed to, what you wanted. But five pages in, my agent missed the fact that I'd signed away all my overtime. I was getting paid a fixed fee for the film now. And that cost me thousands. Yeah. I mean thousands, because it went you know, into major. And I fired that agent. <laughs> but you know, you, so you need hot agents. You need an agent once your career's gone on, because they get deals that you would never dream of asking for, both in terms of money and ancillary bits.